when you get a psychology, occupational therapy or speech and language therapy report, you are likely to see several different types of scoring systems and this can be seriously confusing. It is even more confusing when you have to compare standard scores with scaled scores because they use different averages and standard deviations and so on. In this two-part video series, I'm going to make these scoring systems make sense in a way that everybody can understand and also help you understand how each scoring system relates to each other. I'm also going to talk about the challenges of assessment scores and why we need to interpret these with caution. My name is Kathy Curran. I'm a pediatric occupational therapist and psychologist and mum of two special needs boys. We're going to look at eight topics. And before you worry, yes, there will be some technical terms, but I'm going to explain everything in everyday words. In this video, we're going to look at one, how do test developers get their scores? Two, what are standard deviations? Three, different types of scoring systems. Four, percentiles, their advantages and disadvantages. And five, why it's important for any child's scores to be balanced which I believe to be the most important thing to consider. Six, why age equivalents aren't particularly helpful. Seven, how do you know if scores are reliable and what do confidence intervals mean? And eight, the limitations of testing. Each of these topics is bookmarked below if you want to jump ahead to any particular topic. Firstly, how do test developers get their scores? When test developers develop their tests, they get many different children of different ages to complete the questions and tasks and they mark down their scores and compare them. So for example, they might take 100 children of a particular age, let's say 10 years, six months old, and carry out all the assessment tasks on them. They are then going to plot these scores on a graph and if their test is a reasonable reflection of the skills that they're trying to test, they expect to get a graph that looks like this, which is also called the bell curve. If they don't get this pattern, they're going to redesign their test until they do. In this graph, you can see that most children will get a score around the midpoint, which they call the mean. Although a few children will score exactly on the midpoint, most children's scores will be scattered somewhere around the midpoint, which is actually quite okay. We all have our areas of personal strength and weakness. What we will notice is that most of the scores will fall around the middle area with a small number of children doing particularly well and a small number of children doing particularly poorly. Which brings us to standard deviations. We next need to decide which of these scores fall within the average range for a group of children and which scores we need to be more concerned about. What test developers do is determine where the middle 68% of children lie. And these scores will be within what we call one standard deviation from the mean. 95% of scores will fall within two standard deviations of the mean. So this could be one standard deviation above the mean or below the mean, or two standard deviations above the mean or below the mean. So you can see a decent percent of scores fall within the first standard deviation of the mean, and we call this the average range. We start to have some concerns when a child's score falls outside of this first standard deviation. This we call the above average or below average range. And of course, a high percentage of children still fall within the two standard deviations above or below the mean. So when a child's score falls further than two standard deviations above or below the mean, this raises more concerns. We call this the high or low range, or sometimes it's called the upper extreme or lower extreme range. Now you're probably wondering why I said we'll have more concerns if a child's score falls more than two standard deviations above the mean. If this is, for example, an intellectual test, it could suggest that the child is gifted, and this sounds like a great thing. But unfortunately, it still is a concern for us because gifted kids need to have their needs met in a school. And if they're in a typical classroom doing typical work, their needs are not likely to be met and this can lead to mental health concerns or behavioral challenges. So these standard deviations form the basis for any scoring system. And once we understand this, we can make sense of any test as long as we know where it falls on the standard deviation curve. Now let's look at some different types of scoring systems. The most common is standard scores. Standard scores have a mean of 100 and a standard deviation of 15. 
What this means is that 100 is the midpoint and the first standard deviation is 15 points above the mean or to 15 points below the mean. Many people will be familiar with this kind of scoring system because this is typically how we quote IQ scores. This means, as I said, 100 is the midpoint and any scores that fall between 85 and 115 fall within the average range. Any score that falls between 70 and 84 fall in the below average range and scores between 116 and 130 fall in the above average range. Scores below 70 are in the lower extreme range and scores above 130 are in the upper extreme range. Another common scoring system is scaled scores. Scaled scores typically have a midpoint of 10 and a standard deviation of 3. So in this scoring system, any score between 7 and 13 would fall within the average range. Scores between 4 and 6 are in the below average range. Scores between 14 and 16 are in the above average range. And scores below 4 are in the lower extreme. And scores above 16 are in the upper extreme range. We can talk about many different scoring systems, but once we know where the midpoint and the standard deviations are, we can make sense of each system in the same way. Percentiles, their advantages and disadvantages. Personally, I do find percentiles easy to understand. Percentiles mean the percent of children who would get a particular score or below. So for example, 50th percentile means 50% of children would score that score or lower. 10th percentile means 10% of children would get that score or lower. If we relate percentiles to standard deviations, we can see that 50th percentile is the midpoint. Scores that fall between 16th and 84th percentile are within the average range. Scores that fall between 3rd and 15th percentile are in the below average range. And scores that fall between 85 and 97th percentile are in the above average range. And of course, scores that fall below the 3rd percentile or scores that fall above the 97th percentile are within the upper extreme or lower extreme range. But percentiles are not percentages, and it's very important to remember that. If, for example, a child comes home with 40% on a maths paper, we might consider this to be quite a poor score. However, if a child scores on the 40th percentile, we can clearly see that this falls within the average range. Another challenge with percentile scores is that the difference between percentiles is not evenly spaced along the graph. So for example, if we look at 47th percentile compared to 50th percentile, that's 3 percentile difference, it's a very small distance along this graph. But if we look at the difference between 2nd percentile and 5th percentile, you'll notice that this is a much greater difference along this graph. The reason for this is because of the high number of children who fall within the average range. And where this is an issue for interpretation is two areas. Number one, if we try and compare a child who scores on the fifth percentile with a child who scores on the second percentile, it might appear that there's not much difference between the two. However, there is a reasonably substantial difference. And another issue would be how much a child has improved in any test score. For example, if we test a child before intervention and we retest a child a year after intervention and their scores have improved by 10 percentiles. If the scores improve from 40th percentile to 50th percentile, while this is good, it's not statistically significant. But if the child's scores have improved from 2nd percentile to 12th percentile, then this is a more statistically significant improvement. So while percentiles can help us compare a child to other children, Percentiles can be skewed on the ends of the scale. Now, why should scores be balanced? This is something that I consider to be the most important aspect of test scoring interpretation. As we mentioned above, most children's scores will fall within the middle 68% of scores. A small number of children will score particularly well, and a small number of children will score particularly poorly. But what is important to know is if these scores are what we expect for a particular child. All children have different potentials. This is just a fact of life. This can change depending on genetics and environment. But overall, we expect a few children to be gifted, a few children to have an intellectual disability, and most children to function within the average range. For a child with an intellectual disability, we can expect that they will be delayed in their cognitive reasoning, language skills, motor skills, academics, and so on. 
And likewise for a child in the gifted range, we will expect them to excel in their cognitive reasoning, language skills, motor skills, academics, and so on. Now we all have personal strengths and weaknesses. Once these personal strengths and weaknesses fall within one standard deviation on the bell curve, we consider this to be within the expected range. This means that most of us will have different scores in different areas of our lives, but these won't be dramatically different. If we look at our graph, we expect this range of scores to be this distance from each other. Whether this difference is on the higher end of the scale or this difference is on the lower end of the scale is somewhat unimportant. What's most important is for all of our scores to fall within a reasonable range of each other. What is of concern to us is when any score falls outside of this range for any particular child. Let's take for example a child who has a cognitive ability score of 100 and a handwriting score of 90. As we can see, this is within the range that we expect for this child, and so we're not concerned about this. Let's take, for example, a child who has an intellectual ability score of 130 and a handwriting score of 90. If we look at this handwriting score in isolation, we would consider it to be of no concern. However, if we look at the distance between the child's intellectual score and his handwriting score, we will see that this distance is actually quite large. In fact, it's more than two standard deviations away from each other. And this is an area of concern. This means this child's handwriting is not performing to the level expected of his ability. And this is where we would want to intervene for this child. Failing to intervene here, even though the handwriting score is within the average range, can lead to high levels of frustration or even anxiety and other mental health or behavioral concerns for this child. This could also mean that this child is limited in the way they express their intellectual ability in handwriting. And unfortunately, handwriting is one of the main ways in which we assess a child in today's education system. So in this child's case, it's important that we either remediate for handwriting if this is possible, provide a laptop for school, or intervene in the area of mental health if this is necessary. In any event, it's important for us to intervene for the child's benefit. Well done in sticking through to the end of this video. I know it was intense, but I hope it helped you make sense of any assessment scores you might get for yourself or for your child. I really would encourage you to watch the second part in this series. Although it's important to make sense of scores, we really need to understand that scoring and testing has its limitations. And it's important that we understand what those are so we don't rely too strongly purely on assessment scores. Please like this video if it helped you to understand scores better. Not only does this support me in my work, but it also allows YouTube to recommend this video to other viewers. You can also support me by subscribing to my channel and clicking the bell button if you want to be notified of any upcoming videos I have. I look forward to seeing you again in my follow-up video. In the meantime, hang in there and keep moving forward. Bye!